The Destruction of Black Civilization, Chapter 4, The First Cataract, The Black World's New Borderline. Having lost both Upper and Lower Egypt, Ethiopia's northern border had been pushed to the first cataract at Aswan, and Nico II eventually became king of Egypt, beginning the 26th dynasty in 665 to 525 BC. The Egyptian armies were increasingly made up of foreigners and enslaved blacks. It was during this dynasty that the Assyrians were expelled again, this time by nationalistic Egyptians. The blacks' loss of their beloved Memphis, Thebes, and even their Egyptian name now seemed to be final. Other invasions came. The Persians under Darius the Great took over, and their domination of Egypt lasted from 525 to 404 BC with the assistance of Greek mercenaries. They returned in 343 BC to reestablish their rule, but again for only a relatively short duration. Alexander reached Egypt in 332 BC on his world conquering rampage. But one of the greatest generals in the ancient world was also the Empress of Ethiopia. This was the formidable black queen Candace, world famous as a military tactician and field commander. Legend has it that Alexander could not entertain even the possibility of having his world fame and unbroken chain of victories marred by risking a defeat at last by a woman. He halted his armies at the borders of Ethiopia and did not invade to meet the, the waiting black armies with their queen in personal command. Upon his death, one of the most outstanding generals became Pharaoh as Ptolemy I, thus beginning 300 years of Macedonian Greek rule. Toward the end of Greek domination, the expansion of the Roman Empire had transferred the real center of power to Rome. Assyria, Persia, Greece, Rome, the continuing process of transforming a black civilization into a near white civilization long before the Christian era. The Ptolemaic period had been largely one of confusion. The division of power among the Greeks, Macedonians, and Egyptians and intermarriages with the latter, joint rule, etc., made the Ptolemies at times merely nominal rulers. There were times when a native Afro-Asian ruler gained the center of the stage at a star attraction, as in case of Cleopatra. Upon her death in 30 BC, Romans assumed direct control ruling the country for seven centuries, beginning their reign 30 years before Jesus Christ would be born in the same Palestine where blacks had lived and ruled so long. After this long period of domination, the Arab general Amir ibn Anas entered Alexandria in 642 AD with only 4,000 men. The conquest of Egypt by Muslim armies, which had reached Pelusium two years earlier, was not only to change the character of Egypt's civilization radically, but it was to have a disastrous impact on the dignity and destiny of Africans as a people. The Arab conquest had opened the floodgates wider and Arabs poured in. Colonization and Islamization progressed. As Egypt became a main center of Arab power, this fact found concrete expression in Arab Islamic expansion over North Africa into Spain and southward into what remained as the land of the blacks. The New Borderline of the Blacks We have traced the ancient struggles between Africans, mulattoes, and Asians where the Africans sought not only to resist conquest, but to retake the whole of Egypt. They succeeded at times, but finally lost all of Egypt, as we see, have seen. Ethiopia now began to the first cataract in the north and extended south into present-day Ethiopia. It was now bounded by Upper Egypt, the Red Sea, and the Libyan Desert. These are rather general geographical designations without any precise meaning, for ancient Ethiopia had no precise southern boundaries. Ancient Ethiopians would say that their land included Egypt and was in fact without boundaries in Africa insofar as non-Africans were concerned. All of European and Asian doctrines about unoccupied regions of Africa at any given period in history are quite meaningless and unacceptable to Africans. For to them, it is just as senseless as it would be to say that a farmer anywhere See here now, there are large sections of your land unoccupied and unattended, so we'll just come in and take it. The African's area of great concentration was ancient Nubia, between the first and the sixth cataract. It was the land where they had developed the great civilization which they had extended over Egypt. Their work had been appropriated by the invaders as their own. The geography of Nubia is the geography of much of present-day Sudan and beyond. The Nile flows through its sand and rock deserts with a series of falls and a number of rapids. The country is almost rainless. It is a land of great Nubian desert, 
West of the Nile towards the Red Sea was the mining area, rich in gold. It was even within the concept of these geographical boundaries, the heartland of the black world. Already pushed by the invaders from the Mediterranean areas in the north, northeast and northwest, the Africans were to be further hedged in from the east and southwest as the Asian hordes continued to stream across the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, much later as the Dutch Boers poured in from the southernmost tip of the continent. Scraps from prehistory. The Stone Age Africans lived about the same as Stone Age peoples all over the world. They were hunters, fishermen, and craftsmen. Archaeologists have dug up some of their tools and other artifacts at Wadi Halfa, Wawa, Sai Island, Wadi Hudi, and Salima Oasis, Tangasi, Tagia, and other places. These areas are between the second and fourth cataracts. One discussion of specific concrete evidence of early black civilization up to this point has been confined to the Egyptian north. Most notable among the Neolithic finds in the south were the, be were the beautiful, highly burnished, black-topped and red powdery, potterly bowls, jars, and etc. The pottery was artistically decorated in wavy ripples or squares. The earliest writings was in pictures. So many hundreds of these rock messages were found along Nile through Nubia land that one may wonder if these prehistoric historians had posterity in mind. While many of the pictures portrayed wildlife and other objects interest in the environment, others went beyond the role of the artist and recorded such historic facts as the conquest of northern Nubia by the Nubian pharaoh of the Old Kingdom, Sneferu, in 2730 BC. This war left a vast wasteland and practically wiped out a civilization that had been developing before Neolithic times. The Children of the Sun for one thing, the land of the south of Egypt had developed a strong economic economy and was continuously enriching by thriving export trade in paper from papyrus, papyrus, ivory, gold, ebony, emeralds, copper, incense, ostrich feathers, always greatly in demand, and its famous decorated earthenware. A strong economy also meant a strong Ethiopian army, posing a threat even to an African ruler in African ruled Egypt. From the Egyptian viewpoint, the land of the blacks was a threefold feat. Historically, the blacks who had fled below the first cataract to escape the various conquests never seemed to accept those conquests as final and attempted to retake Egypt each time to time. These repetitions are deliberate because nowhere in history is their very important fact clearly stated. But it is clear that having reconquered the Asian-dominated Lower Egypt, the Black Pharaohs sought integration with the Asians instead of driving them out of the country. This policy of moderation and accommodation was apparently anathema to the extremist Ethiopians, proud blacks for whom the prospects of having their children come into the world with a color distinctly different from their own was at once an insult to their watching ancestors and an offense to the gods themselves. This attitude might also explain the hostility of the Southern Blacks toward the Afro-Asians. The latter were not true Africans because they were becoming Egyptians, a mixed breed of many races. They were therefore traitors in the eyes of true Africans whose badge of eternal honor was the blackness of their skin. This was color racism. Deeply rooted for it sprang from religion. There were the children of the sun, blessed with blackness by the sun god himself and thus protected from his fiery rays. They were his children. Their very blackness, therefore, was religious, a blessing and an honor. The second already stated threat was econ economic. Egypt's own flourishing export trade, both by sea and caravans, depended heavily on her imports from the south. To cut these off would mean economic panic in otherwise prosperous land. The third great fear concerning the mighty Nile River, suppose the Ethiopians decided to bring Egypt to her knees and starve her to death by diverting the waters of the Nile. Belief in the possibility was ancient and ran deep. The Egyptian conquest of Nubia, therefore, might remove the military and economic threats, but insofar as the Nile was concerned, it would settle nothing. Besides, these blacks seemed to be unconquerable. A Sneferu might attempt total extermination of a population, burning every town and village, destroying farms, cattle, leaving the land in utter ruin. Yet as soon as the armies of destruction withdrew, the surviving Africans would come out from their hiding places and began to rebuild once again. Like Upper Egypt, this was a land of cities and towns and temples and pyramids. Africans were the great pyramid builders, the temple builders. They had built the great pyramids of Egypt during their rule. 
renewed activity in temple building came after Nubia was reoccupied by the 18 dynasty rulers. All this renewed zeal in building new towns and temples in the south was reconstruction. The old kingdom raiders could not destroy all of the temples and other monuments. The returning Egyptians, therefore, have found many fine temples still in use, others in ruins. All Ethiopian inscriptions on the temples and monuments were erased and Egyptian inscriptions were substituted. All outstanding African creations that could not be converted and claimed as the work of each Egyptians were destroyed. For now, Egyptian meant white, Asian or European. This was done to promote national unity. Ethiopian inscriptions, of course, recorded victories over Egypt. The Arabs were to carry out the work of eradication in a far more thoroughgoing manner at a later time. All of the South was never completely conquered. The reconquest we are now discussing extended 40 or 50 miles below Abu Hamed. History continued to repeat itself and below the area of conquest, the Africans continued to rebuild, reorganizing their fighting forces and watching an overextended Egypt become weaker and weaker under weak pharaohs who were unable to cope with the inter interminable struggle for power among the, the Asians, Egyptians, and other incursive groups. In these cycles of consolidation, followed by fragmentation into numerous chiefdoms and principalities, Egypt mirrored the result of the human power craze, not only in Africa, but generally throughout the world. Yet in a long view of her history, Egypt's overall record was one of consolidation and unity that at times was not seriously broken for a thousand years. Napata was a beautiful city that was favored by surroundings that helped to make it so. It was located below the fourth cataract above the great curve where the Nile had turned southward and as though changing its, tur its mind turned north again. An imposing hill, the throne of the sun god was the site of temples. The city itself was regarded as the Holy of Holies, the capital of what the Egyptians called the land of the gods, but Napata referred not only to the central city, but included what today would call a metropolitan area that covered towns and villages for miles in all directions from the present day town of Karima. It was to this area that African leaders, including priests of various cults, retreated when things got too hot in Egypt. Here also certain African kings preferred to stay even when their position and power in Egypt were unchallenged. Most of the royal burials and pyramids were at Kulu. The largest pyramid in Ethiopia is, at the, is that of King Taharqa at Nuri. After the Assyrian Greek invasion in 590 BC, the city was again almost completely destroyed. The capital was moved to the other side of the river to Moreau, the historic industrial center. The blacks apparently had been more concerned with the developing, development of their copper industry than with iron. Iron ore was in abundance. The earlier failure to exploit it, especially for military weapons, was the reason Assyrians, with their superior iron weapons, were able to sweep the blacks out of Egypt, invading the heartland and destroying the holy city of Napata. The Africans had long since learned the use of iron. They knew all about the smelting process. Why did they allow the Assyrians to get ahead of them? Or well, granting that the ancients kept their military development secret, as nations try to do today, it was also true that spies, including Africans, were active everywhere. The question is interesting because we're not discussing the period when the African had ultimately surrendered to despair and retrogression, but a period of African power, high civilization, and the greatness respected and feared by the ancient world. Even after the onslaught by the Assyrians and their allies, the Africans were to rebuild from the new capital city of Moreau, a civilization greater than the one it just destroyed. There were many lesser states and countless small chiefdoms in a vast land mass that began where the effective control by Ethiopia ended. Through all these millenniums of ups and downs, of trials and errors, of great victories and disastrous defeats, through it all, the central drive of this once black land was in the direction of consolidation and progress. Tribes were united in one nation under voluntary, either voluntarily or failing by force. Strong armies were maintained to protect and expand their civilization. The retaking of the part of the homeland that extended north along the Nile and the Mediterranean was once the deathless dream, the impassioned goal, and the cornerstone of the foreign policy. These Africans battled the invading Asians decade after decade and century after century until their resistance to conquest and enslavement extended over 4,000 years. From ancient days, therefore, the Africans had had in their very center of the heartland on the continent, 
a history from which their posterity could learn how unity alone provided the condition for strength and progress, and that each one of the thousand little independent chiefdoms were but a standing invitation to the aggressors and the ultimate domination of all. Why did Africans fail to take this message of salvation as a revealed truth from their own history? What dim civilizations lighted on Barkle Hill and caused an ultimate withdrawal to the bush and a scattering of people hither and yon like hunted beasts? Why did Africans begin to retire from the race with other advancing peoples and fall so far behind that even the memory of former greatness could not inspire a revival because the memory had been almost completely blotted out? I have been detailing some of the answers throughout and in latter chapters we shall explore further answers to questions raised. We now cross at the west bank of the Nile, a journey farther south to the city of Moreau. It is the 8th century BC and a move to Moreau was simply a move to what was already the southern capital, only now, instead of having two capital cities in the south, there would be only one. The development of writing. The distinguished line of leaders who followed Tanutamon to the throne in 653 BC at Lenursa, Senka Mensenkin, Anlaman, Aspalta, Amtalka, and Melenikan, palace, temple, and pyramid builders all. Two of the greatest temples were built by King Aspalta at Mero, the Sun Temple and the Temple of Amman. The imposing pyramids and rows of huge royal statues added to the majesty and magnificence of Mero. The royal tombs as in Egypt were the repositories of the nation's history. From them, archaeologists were able to determine a line of 41 rulers after the conquest of Lower Nubia. These monuments were not only sources of early African history from within, but the highest importance. They were elaborately decorated outside with both the first form of writing, hieroglyphics, and the more advanced African inscriptions in their own invented writing. For the Africans themselves had invented writing, and all attempts to connect this ancient achievement with Egyptian or Asiatic influence have failed. Here the external influence, school has suffered a major defeat because the written records found on statues, altars, tombstones, graffiti, etc. are so distinctly African that their native origin could not be successfully disputed. Moreover, the African system of writing was very different from the Egyptian. It was simpler and had vowels, whereas Egyptian had none. There were 23 characters or letters in the African alphabet four vowel sounds, 17 consonants, and two signs of the syllable. New concepts or new or special words could be easily introduced by the old picture system. Clarity and easy reading was assured by measured spacing between words. A system of numerical numbers for mathematics was developed. The African inscriptions on monuments and such records as those found in rural tombs were in special category. General writing was done on tablets of wood and skins prepared for that purpose, and such things as rocks, walls, bases, and broken bits and pieces of earthenware comprised other artifacts where ancient African writing was found. Again, how and why did all of this disappear? How and why was it blotted out or hidden so completely for 2,000 years that an ignorant world with unprecedented research facilities in its universities still believes, teaches, and proclaims that the black man had never developed a civilization of his own. It has been noted that the attractions of Ethiopia, the land of the gods, were great not only because the Egyptians regarded it as the main source of their religion, but also because of the socio-political, economic, and strategic importance. When African kings reconquered Egypt and became Egyptian pharaohs, they still longed for the motherland to the south, desiring to unite the whole of it with Egypt into one vast empire. They would often retire there, some wanting their final resting place to be in the pyramid below the first cataract. To the south rested their ancestors whose company they were to join. It was the capital city of both the black man's world and that of his heaven as well, the holy city of Napata. During the different periods in which Napata came under foreign yoke, the capital city of Moreau had to become somewhat holy in its own right, and many of the kings, queens, and other leaders were buried in pyramids here. These were constructed of stone outside of the city, proper sometimes at a visible distance of two or more miles. They were built to stand forever, an attempt that stemmed from the Africans' actual belief in immortality. 
This is why their faith includes a natural assumption that those who had passed on, their ancestors, were living in the great beyond, and were therefore in a most favorable position to represent the interests of their kinsmen below, or in short, to serve as mediators between God and man. The pyramids ringing the city not only added to the physical beauty of their surroundings, but they were also the silent sentinels, the ever watchful ancestral presence from which might come either a benediction or a curse. Earlier, you may recall, I was unsparing in my criticism of those African societies which seemed to be governed by fatalism and failed to counterattack against their natural and human enemies. As I read the record, it seemed to me that these groups did not try to meet the awful challenges which confronted them. They gave up too readily and refused to ignore tribal lines or to unite for common survival strategies. They remained scattered here and there like hunted animals, moving into barbarism and savagery. Such were my strictures and obviously I did not give the whole story even about these groups. Now however, and by a glorious contrast, we are in the midst of blacks, the core group of all Africa, who met the challenge on all fronts and from very in every direction who fought on and on through the centuries against the forces of man and nature until they themselves were completely overwhelmed. 3,000 years ago, the desert, while slowly moving in in Africa, had not advanced to where it is today. There was more arable land in Ethiopia, although its agriculture did not match that of the rich Delta region of Egypt. The blacks were, however, mainly agriculturalists like other Africans. Even with the remarkable industrial developments, farming went on both sides where the two Niles met on their land before continuing as one great river through Egypt to the Mediterranean Sea. Nor should the importance of the Atbara River be overlooked. Even though the surrounding deserts were a problem insofar as agricultural expansion was desired, the more immediate problem was famine from drought. There were years during which no rain fell at all and not a hopeful cloud appeared in the sky. The Africans met the challenge by constructing a national system of reservoirs. These are strategically located around the capital at Musawara, Naga, Hordan, Um, Usada, and in the Gezira region at Duwani, Basa, and doubtlessly at other sites not yet excavated. The master plan to defeat drought and famine by a system of reservoirs was more important than all of the ar ar architectural art that found expression in their beautiful statues, temples, palaces, columns, and pyramids. The reservoirs were more significant than the monuments, important as these in hiding the black man's intellectual achievements and the invention of writing deep under the sands. I hate the reservoir. I rate the reservoirs as a supreme achievement because they reflect the real measure of African man, as he met the challenge to survive head on with a constructive counterattack against the adverse forces of earth, sun, and sky. The irrigation system made reasonable and reasonably effective with their oxen powered wheels as a part of the challenge to adverse circumstances. Pianchi, following Kashta in 720 BC, began what was quickly to become one, again, one of the greatest world powers of the time. Ethiopia was united with Afro-Asian Egypt under a single imperial rule and extended from the Mediterranean in the north to the undefined boundary in the south. Also unknown was how far its eastern board boundary extended southward along the Indian Ocean coastline, how much of Uganda and Abyssinia was included on how far westward the empire extended. All this is not so important as the point that during the period of triumph, world fame, fear, and an unprecedented prosperity from a flourishing trade with about one half of the world, African rulers continued to neglect the updating of their military and naval defenses. Iron was the basis of technolo technological revolution and warfare. That the Assyrians, Hittites, Persians, and other Asiatic nations were equipping their armies with new types of iron weapons and that these were devastatingly more effective than stone and copper weapons had been well known to Africans. It was not news. As was mentioned before, they had not only knew about the use of iron, but they had long since developed the iron smelting processes. The trouble was the highly secretive royal monopoly. No secret is more zealously guarded than the smelting of iron. This meant rigidly limiting production. Here was far fear outmatching both reason and the most elementary, elementary common sense. This over-secretiveness, which inhibited the expansion of iron production, was to contribute mightily to the success of the Assyrian arms over them. Prosperity, too, may have blurred the Africans' vision. 
too much success can be dangerous. In this case, so much wealth was piled up from foreign trade, especially in gold, ivory, and copper, that the question of iron, if raised, may have been dismissed on economically unsound. Whatever the reasons were, the fact is that the great iron industries which had developed in the center spreading over Africa could have started centuries before. Even as early as 300 BC, when iron smelting was employed for more useful purposes and ornaments, the royal monopoly still prevented widespread use. That they knew of importance of iron is shown by the fact that the kings and high priests were often heads of the guild and chief iron masters would often gain the status of what a prime minister is today. Regardless of the delay, iron smelting and tool making got underway on a vast scale in Ethiopia at its most crucial period for Africa. Its center was Moreau, and it appears that the biggest iron works were in and around the capital city. This development was at a crucial period because it was a period of increasing migrations from the heartland and the scattering of groups all over Africa. They carried their knowledge of this great technological revolution wherever they went, and they began the use of iron and development of iron industries wherever they had the opportunity to settle in iron ore areas and to remain settled long enough to create a stable society. The spread of iron working from the cradle of black civilization is most just another example of how fundamental African institutions spread over the continent, north as well as south, and remained basically unchanged down through the centuries. No matter how numerous were the groups into which the original society became fragmented or how countless were the various languages and dialects that resulted from the segmentation, there were, as a matter of course, many variations and modifications by different survival groups. This is most remarkable of the facts that even those groups were pushed back into a state of barbarism still held on, God only knows how, to some of the basic institutions of society from which they descended from one or two thousand years before. Neither Christian, Europe, or Muslim Asia were able to completely destroy these institutions, even in the vast regions over which the both had supreme control. And this is why, in a previous discussion, I have suggested a smile of compassion when you read or hear about Egyptian influence on this or the black society, because in general, all that could possibly be meant is the influence of early black civilization on subsequent black societies. The expansion of the iron culture, however, was a revolution in technolo technology that ushered in a new age and gave new hope to a despairing people. It meant the use of new instruments of production of agriculture and industrial crafts of great importance for a refugee people, for a new kind of military organization and defense. It can be seen then that the motherland of the black centered on the Nile around the cataracts provided her wandering sons and daughters with the instruments of survival, a knowledge that still served them well centuries after the Arabs and Turks overran the motherland. The memory of many things had been lost. However, who remembered Thebes, Napata, Memphis, Elephantine, Heraclopolis, and Nekev? Indeed, who remembered even Moreau, the most advanced, not only of the African age, but also of writing? And what of the other important towns and cities in southern Ethiopia? Nubia, Kush, Musawarat, Nuri, Panopolis, Kerma, Aswan, Solib, Abu Simbel, Kurusku, Samna, Pile, Kawa, Dangola, etc. Our constant references to Napata and Moreau might be led to think that, who do not look at the map, to think that they were only two important cities in the land. Forgetting the names of ancient centers of importance, now it was nothing compared to the tragedy of the blacks and almost completely forgetting the very art of writing which they invented themselves. This was one of the most tragic losses to repeat that was never suffered by a whole people. And in view of the anti-black course of subsequent history, the blacks needed their written language and records more than any other people. Just how and why this people discontinued the use of writing has been set forth rather clearly in some detail in the foregoing pages. However, the matter is of such transcendent importance that I hope that some black scholar will devote an entire book detailing this one episode in a long history of Africans. The story would cover the periods of migrations and dispersions when writing was needless, if not impossible, and the general loss of the art itself. I say general loss again because, of course, some African societies did not completely lose the art of writing under conditions where it has seemed utterly futile. The most important fact to keep in mind, however, is that we are considering the early age when relatively few people could write a small professional class, the scribes. All books, scrolls, inscriptions, letters, etc. were written by them. Therefore, in any society where the scribes were either captured or for whatever reason disappeared, the art of writing in a society died. In view of the developments in black Africa, the disappearance of writing is not a mystery at all. 
Conquest and domination tended to check migrations and bring a larger measure of iron-ruled stability to the invaded region. An integral part of that iron rule was the induction and introduction of the conqueror's speech and writing, the first step in the process of conquering the soul and minds of the blacks along with their bodies. This was easy because knowledge starved key people among the blacks e eagerly grasped Arabic, French, Portuguese, English, or German as the best route to status in a new civilization. Most of the developed later than the period we have been summarizing. A thousand years in Ethiopia after its last success in retaking Egypt and its defeat and withdrawal with the fall of the 25th dynasty. Here we speak of the period from 6th century BC to the 4th century of the Christian church in Ethiopia. Christian Africa. Africa was naturally among the first areas to which Christianity spread. It was next door to Palestine. And from the earliest times, there had been the closest relations between the Jews and the blacks, both friendly and hostile. The exchange of pre-Christian religious concepts took place easily, and due to the residence of so many ancient Jewish leaders in Ethiopia, Abraham, Moses, and his brothers, Mary and Jesus, the great lawgiver Moses was not only born in Africa, but he is, was also married to the daughter of an African priest. The pathway for the early Christian church in the land of the blacks had been made smooth many centuries before. In a different work, I suggested that the major reason why so many latter Christian missionaries failed in Africa was because they were bringing refurbished religious doctrine that came from Africa in the first place. The religious belief in sacrifice for the remission of sins was an African belief that practiced at least 2,000 years before Abraham. The result of a comparative study of the African, Jewish, and Christian religions have amazed many who have undertaken the task. Practically all of the Ten Commandments were embedded in the African Constitution ages before Moses went up Mount Sinai in Africa in 1491 BC, a rather late date in African history. We do not know how much significance could be raised into the fact that Christianity began to spread in Ethiopia, Nubia or Kush, only after the destruction of the Central Empire within the fall of Moreau. However, the most important development that the Empire passed was not the rise of Christianity, but the rise of the two black states that picked up the mantle and staff of Ethiopia to carry on. These two states were Mercuria and Alwa.